My name is Tim Riley. I'm the COO. Jim Vogt. I am not Jim Vogt. He's our CEO. He is not here. So we decided we needed two people to make up for not having him. So this is Maxim Yankovsky. He's our VP of Engineering. And I hope there's questions that I won't be able to answer. And that's exactly why he's here. Okay. So I don't know if this is an interesting, catchy title, but uh, Software Defined Security. We are Software Defined Encryption specifically within DevOps. Uh, we've worked with Pivotal extensively for now three years plus. We've worked with them on the data services side with Greenplum. Now with uh, PCF, I guess I have to start calling it Pivotal Platform now. If I say Cloud Foundry, forgive me. <laughs> and uh, we're now moving into working with PKS, with Kubernetes, and having uh, Docker container encryption along with other container encryption. So you can see, based on what we've got in the world right now, data is everything. And this one always makes me very interested that 90% just in two years. That's, it's unfathomable how quickly we've gone to that. 16 zettabytes. So I'm not sure, it's always a good uh, crowd thing. How many uh, gigabytes is a zettabyte? Any idea? A lot. Yeah. It's one trillion. One trillion gigabytes is one zettabyte. So we went from, I guess globally, 2013, we hit one zettabyte. 2016, we hit four. Here we are five years later, or sorry, three years later, we're at 16. And IDC says by 2025, we'll be at 175 zettabytes. So it's growing. It's growing pretty fast. And we all know the folks that are creating a lot of this data. Um, and I think it's interesting because they're more data hounds than they are their own offerings, if you look at that. Uh, we all know Uber. I just got the Jump app today, so I can only imagine how much data they'll collect on me around Austin tonight and tomorrow. Um, the other one that's interesting is uh, Alibaba. Not a, no inventory, the world's largest. Um, so these are kind of a, one, obviously some of the reasons we need data encrypted, security around it. Obviously not everything out there needs to be encrypted, but ask yourself why not just do it all. Everybody has an iPhone that comes with encryption already. Why not just encrypt everything? You don't need to encrypt one piece of your iPhone. Encrypt it all. So that's going to be the mantra for us. And with regards to encryption, don't let anybody touch it unencrypted. You know, if anybody, whether it's a virtual or a physical theft, if they get a hold of it, as long as it's ciphertext and not um, decrypted, and they don't have the key, it's worthless to them. Absolutely worthless. So if that's the case, everyone's going to lose data. And data is going to be breached, and there's going to be thefts. So encrypt everything. Okay, and based on all the data that we have out there, this is interesting. Look at how things have migrated from 2001 to 2018. You can see that we've migrated from an energy-focused economy to a data-driven economy. I, Amazon is pretty impressive on that one. Uh, it looks like uh, Apple got there and hasn't moved. So, and I would imagine all of these guys have some level of DevOps. And with all this data, look at all the innovation you have to come up with. You want to reduce the cost, and you have to find some way to leverage the value out of it. And I think that's what a lot of you guys are here for. So with all that power, all that data, all that sensitivity of the data, how do you protect it? There's, you're going to have some level of breaches. But again, if you encrypt it all, you can protect it. But look at the size of that every day. There's that many breaches and thefts. I'm not sure which groups you guys fall into in these verticals. Maybe you've had this, but I was surprised to see how high tech was out of it. So six million a day. All you got to do is encrypt them. 95% of everything that's ever been theft-wise, a data breach, was unencrypted. Sounds like a pretty simple solution. Okay. So here we are as far as, let's quantify it for a second. You have all these breaches. You can see various pieces. This was done, uh, this is done annually, by the way, this survey. So 3.62 million, uh, that, that will impact, and that doesn't even account for reputation, which sensitivity to that, we all know, yes, there's some that they're too big to fail, so even if they have a breach, people will still continue to use their service, but the other 99%, they may take an impact because there's other services and other customers and other vendors they can go to. So again, look at the data breaches. Everyone agrees 
they're going to increase, but it's still not considered a priority. So who's going to be the first exposed company within the DevOps realm where they should have encrypted, but they didn't? That really is what we're trying to avoid before this becomes too big. So here we are. We look at this and we say, all right, we have this wealth of data, which each one of you in your individual companies has, but production is, seems to be the only place where it's protected. When it comes to the development, it is sensitive data. It may not be in production, but it's still sensitive. And for that reason, we feel that there's too much security lag between production and the dev. And unless you do at the same time, which you know, I know there's a lot of DevSecOps initiatives out there, but a lot of times it's an afterthought. And I think everybody realizes security has a finite budget. It's not always the top thing. But at the end of the day, someone's going to lose their job and something's going to go wrong if you don't encrypt it. So how do you get that simple encryption without causing a two-year project that will never get there? And that's where we come in we, with software-only encryption. So that's the whole point of this. There's no hardware involved. It's all software. And I'm going to let Maxim over here talk about how you get breached, uh, which may make you guys all more paranoid. <laughs> um, but there's a reason. And uh, I'll let you take it from here, Maxim. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so how do, how do we get breached? Uh, well, first of all, why do we get breached? Because the information we have is valuable. That's why people try to steal it. Uh, or people try to change the information um, so that it would affect our analytic software. So we can't make the decisions correctly based on the information that we have. And uh, security is never one solution, never one product, never one component. Right? And so because the systems that get breached, it's never one system. Uh, if you look at the history of data breaches, it's um, people get breached over Wi-Fi. People get breached because their firewall is not configured correctly. But a lot of breaches happen um, due to the human factor, which is the biggest threat really is the threat from, from within. So a rogue employee walks into a data center, walks away with the, uh, with the hard drive, or the entire server comes home, connects to the VPN, and before you know it, it's, uh, you know, the, your data has been decrypted. Um, it doesn't really matter how strong your physical security is, because the weakest link of it all is really the human factor. I mean, I have quite a bit of years of experience as a, as a software developer, and uh, if there are software developers here, tell me you've never written a password to a log file. <laughs> so the greatest threat is really within and not always the malicious one. And so if you can't trust your data, then really you cannot run your business. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're encrypting and your keys are secure, but if you can trust your, you know, the human element of it, then you cannot trust your data. Um, so data security and compliance are really, in my experience, it's been two completely different things. Data security, um, you know, the, the initiative is let's protect the data, let's keep the data safe, let's take care of our customers' information. But it has really nothing to do with compliance. Compliance sometimes is doing just enough to pass the security audit, to pass the checks, and to make sure that if the breach were to occur, you're not held liable, as, a, as an enterprise, you're not held liable for a breach. So there's this you know, security architect or security engineer-minded person versus a board of directors saying, how do we get good enough security to pass the audit and to be compliant and maintain our budget? And so we've known security for years, and we've done encryption for years. So why are we worrying about encryption all over again when the new environments come in? Why don't we just take an old encryption, an old key manager that was developed 15, 20 years ago, uh, put it under, you know, whether it be Pivotal Platform or a Linux server or a cloud environment and just call it a day? Right, because everything ultimately gets written to, to, to a storage device somewhere. So why don't we just encrypt the storage device and call it a day? Well, because by doing that, we're really, uh, first of all, we're not scaling. Uh, the big thing about DevOps environment and just in general, the newer trends is, is, is being able to scale very quickly and very efficiently. Uh, legacy solutions will not scale. Um, oftentimes, legacy security solutions require hardware appliances, um, that there's a cost associated with it and so on. And so you want to be able to scale. That's why we're saying right now software is at the state where you could um, 
implement a very strong uh, cryptographically secure solutions and you don't really need hardware for that. Um, you want to operate on-prem, you want to opera operate on cloud, you want to operate in hybrid environments. Again, hardware-based solutions don't fit well in that. You can't have you know, your, your security server shipped to Amazon and have them installed in your data center. Um, so the idea is deploy software-based encryption, uh, deploy it in a manner that is consistent and close to the environment that you're actually running and not something that was developed for legacy environments. And then it will scale, then it will perform, um, and you'll be able to secure your data at the same time. So why we're doing what we're doing and we're applying our security solutions to a number of environments. And um, in the Cloud Foundry, in the Pivotal uh, Data Platform environment, uh, what we found the biggest and, and the best integration point is to integrate with uh, Bosch to be able to transparently and efficiently encrypt all the services that get provisioned um, at the time that they're provisioning and make sure that one of the biggest hurdles for developers is non-existent. Because really, if I'm a developer and if I need to create a key every time I need to deploy in service instance, that's going to be non-starter for me because I'm coding a lot faster than um, you know, key management configuration can take place. So what we're doing, we're essentially creating a solution where uh, the information is kept secure, the information is kept protected, but there's no impact to the user, there's no impact to developer, there's no performance impact. Um, you do your um, deployment commands in the exact same way that you used to do that. Uh, our single tagline that we've been saying for, I think, a few years now, is that our, our goal as a company is to make security so simple and so efficient that there's really no excuse to uh, not, not to deploy it. And so and to do this, the big thing is to maintain transparency, uh, which is you deploy an encrypted system and you operate with an encrypted system in the exact same way as a developer or, or as a user. Uh, you operate the system in the exact same way that you used to operate it before encryption was deployed. So that's, that's the core kind of design philosophy of the Xcrypt encryption platform. Um, and uh, it comprises of certain changes to the Bosch director, the Bosch agent, and uh, if you notice on the left side of the slide, we've actually, we didn't just say, okay, we used to have key managers, so here's a key manager for you. Forget that the fact that it was built a long time ago before cloud was even a thing. Uh, so we give you a um, special Bosch release of the, um, all the essential components that you need to run your encrypted system. That includes the key manager, that includes the uh, software security module that you need to, um, maintain consistency and integrity and security of the key manager itself. And uh, to tie in your um, certificate authority into, into your corporate infrastructure, we give you a certificate authority server. And all of those run in the uh, pivotal environment, um, not external. You don't have to stand up additional servers. All of those get deployed automatically. So this is all happening, you know, quite a few things are happening automatically under the hood and they're quite complex, but the idea of this implementation complexity is so that you as users, as developers, don't have to worry about what does it take to encrypt the data, what does it take, what needs to happen when, let's say, you take a MySQL instance and scale storage from five terabytes to 10 terabytes. What needs to happen with encryption? And what is your corporate key rotation policy? How often do you need to rotate the keys to, to protect your data? You don't need to worry about any of this. It's a one-time configuration. You tell us how many, uh, how often you'd like the keys rotated, and we take care of that, all of it automatically and transparently. So the idea is, again, you walk in, we deploy encryption system today. You walk into your workplace tomorrow, you do PCF deploy MySQL, and it all runs exactly the same way, except the data partitions are secured. And uh, so MySQL is probably the uh, data service name that I hear most um, at pivotal conferences, but there are other data services. And in general, there's been move from PAS architecture to uh, PKS, the uh, pivotal container service. And of course, recognizing that we're, um, and the fact that it's um, based on Kubernetes, uh, we're looking into how do we provide um, the same type of encryption, the same level of security in the world that's going towards containers and managed containers with Kubernetes. Uh, so we just uh, launched our product that offers, uh, again, granular, but also high performance uh, encryption for 
containers uh, for Docker and Kubernetes as well. So that wraps up the technical point of the presentation and uh, any questions in the audience? Go ahead. So the question was whether or not encryption takes place as part of the application logic. Uh, the answer is actually no. Um, that was the old way we used to integrate encryption, which is to encrypt an application. Generally, there's, uh, you can integrate encryption at any point in the step, starting from the storage all the way up to the application. An application does offer the most granular approach to encryption. However, if you don't have access to the source code of the application, then you have no way of encrypting. We're actually encrypting at a reasonably low level. We're encrypting at a storage level. So when the data service such as MySQL gets provisioned, what happens is that when it gets provisioned as storage, that storage is already configured for uh, transparent high-performance encryption. So that allows you not to worry about encryption as application developer, but still maintain um, data security. Yes? When is this product available? When? Yeah. Uh, this product is available now. And it's going to be in the uh, Pivotal Marketplace in the next, I think, two weeks, hopefully. Awesome. Are you looking for beta customers? Mm -hmm. Love some. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the difference between your encryption and the some cloud provider also provide the encryption directly at the, 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 the storage level? Right. Right. The biggest thing, and, and the, it's, it's actually a, a, a good question, so let me repeat it first. What is the difference? Why would you not choose, let's say, AWS encryption um, for the storage volumes? Why would you not choose Azure encryption of the storage volume directly? Um, so the answer is actually pretty simple, but it, it doesn't have the word encryption in it, which is um, encryption as in encrypting the data and decrypting the data has been figured out a long time ago. So that's not the magic. The magic really is the, is the key management. So when you encrypt the par, uh, a data element, you have to generate an encryption key and you have to protect that encryption key because that actually what's, what controls the security of this data element. So what do you do with the key? Um, if you deploy cloud encryption and you ask the, um, let's say AWS to encrypt, AWS offers very convenient uh, KMS service that allows you to store your encryption keys. Well, my question to you back then is then, why, why do you bother to encrypt at all if your cloud provider holds your data but also holds your keys? So what our solution gives you is that you can deploy it on-prem, you can deploy it on cloud, you can deploy it on a mixed environment, but you as the data owner will hold the keys. Not the cloud provider, not whoever's hosting your Cloud Fabry instance, you will be hosting your keys. Great question. Uh, again, the question was, uh, is there integration options for hardware appliances? And yes, so um, as a software-only solution, we are self-contained. We provide you with a key, a key manager and the security module, but also realizing that um, the requirements, and sometimes when you walk into a large enterprises, there's um, existing key managers and HSMs, so we uh, are able to transparently integrate with any key manager that's KMU compliant and any HSM that's PKCS 11 compliant. So it's kind of a crypto 101, you know, you, you, you want to interoperate, you have to maintain KMU and PKCS 11 integration. Go ahead. So we're not so much about uh, encrypting traffic. Uh, we do have solutions to encrypt data in motion, but we're, uh, our main focus is on encrypting data at rest, which is when data is in storage. Um, and we have, um, our, our solution is capable of encrypting data when the container just asks for the storage volume or when the container attaches to an existing storage volume 
and that storage volume did not have encryption deployed before that. Right. The initial question was? The initial question, thank you. The initial question was how do you um, encrypt traffic between containers? It is more focusing on uh, on uh, data addressed. Yeah. From the application developer's point of view or the operator's point of view, what are when, if we add you to a Google platform, what are all the parts you're actually encrypting? Uh, so we're encrypting the data that's associated with uh, the service, the MySQL service that you're running. Um, so the MySQL on demand. I'm sorry. The MySQL on demand. Uh, we're also, we also have a solution to encrypt uh, the Cloud Foundry backup files. And so if you're using uh, Bosch Backup and Restore, we have a product that integrates in the, um, in the Bosch Backup and Restore pipeline and it allows you to transparently um, encrypt and decrypt data that's rep that represents your Cloud Foundry backups. And again, all of our products, including the, that archive product, uh, integrates with the key management infrastructure. So everything happens automatically. Uh, during the backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's correct. The, the, the main uh, focus for, for us is, is really uh, encrypting data at rest. We do have a product that allows you to encrypt uh, data in motion. It is not a container specific problem. Uh, it is not a container specific product. Uh, it was more of, you know, you have two endpoints. They can be containers, they can be physical servers, they can be virtual servers. But as long as you have two endpoints on the TCP channel, uh, we have a product that can attach to that channel and securely encrypt um, all the traffic and again integrate with our um, key management infrastructure. And by the way, the question was, again, I keep forgetting to reiterate the question. The question was building up on the earlier question of uh, how do you protect data when it moves from one container to another? <coughs> Right. Well, the uh, in in our background, we used to do uh, partial encryption or selective encryption, and this was done for one of two reasons, really. The first reason was because encryption was or used to be very very expensive, computation wise, and so we said we're going to separate the data from what needs to be encrypted to what doesn't need to be encrypted, and we're going to encrypt the least possible amount of data. Now encryption is efficient enough that it's really not a concern. And the second one was kind of a misuse of encryption keys to maintain access control. There are very capable access control systems and encryption keys are really not, not a great way to maintain access control. Yeah. My last yeah. question is how do you store your encryption keys? Where and how do you make sure that it's more high available, more protected than the cloud providers? <coughs> okay. Uh, so the question was a uh, good question, by the way. How We protect the integrity of the data, we encrypt the data, but we need to protect the keys. So what do we do in our software to protect the keys? Um, so we have our software-based implementation of the key manager. This software-based implementation is, is talking to a software-based implementation of a security module. We have uh, a proper implementation of the key hierarchy from the master key uh, to dating all the way down to the data encryption key. So it's multi-level keys. Uh, what's ultimately going to give you the biggest security from the cloud provider, um, and by the way, some cloud providers actually chose to deploy um, key managers on-prem and rent kind of leaves you access to those key managers. What separates us from them is that we don't own your keys. We give you software that allows you to own your keys and to store your keys. So even when you put your data in the cloud, you hold your keys. So we need to compete or specify where I store my keys, right? Or manually, like by default, it's using the data volume thing. So by default, it goes to the key manager. And you just have to tell us, is that our software key manager, or is that, for example, Jamal or Talas or another uh, key manager? Okay. 
Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for making the time at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.